Well, Merry Christmas, 7 o'clock service. It is good to have you here. It's great to be able to gather together to hear scripture, to sing song, to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And we gather and we join with literally millions and millions of people across this planet today and this week as, as people on every continent in literally hundreds and thousands of languages and dialects, ethnicities, countries, all across in grand cathedrals, in small chapels, in huge settings, in small huts, in living rooms, all across every, every imaginable setting, people gathering to celebrate the birth of a baby, which is amazing, the birth of a baby from 2,000 years ago, from a small little uh, corner town to a young teenage girl which in and of itself isn't terribly unusual, the birth of a baby. Now, I know that when your baby was born, it was like, you know, the end of the world. You know, everyone needs to focus, and it's the center of all things. But I'm not sure if you're aware, there are, on average, 360,000 births every day on our planet these days. So it's not completely unheard of. All right, there's a lot of these births, and yet there's this one from 2,000 years ago, from this little tiny corner of the world that we're still celebrating today and across the planet, people celebrating, and we're glad that you're here tonight to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. We're excited, and we've been anticipating uh, these services and, and uh, hopeful and, and expecting great things, preparing and praying, but we weren't sure. We didn't know. We didn't know who would show up. But with, with the end on Friday, the end of the uh, Mayan long count calendar, you know, coinciding with the winter solstice and rumors about the reversing of the magnetic poles of the earth and the galactic alignment. We just weren't sure. And, and I know some of you weren't either, but the world didn't end. And for some of you, you had to start scrambling to buy gifts all of a sudden because you didn't want to spend just in case. But, uh, but we're glad that you're here and we're glad that the world didn't end and, and we're, we're glad to be celebrating. It's amazing to me the fascination that people have with the apocalypse, with the, the end of the world, with the doomsday. And, and for some, it's conspiracy theorists, and some people have mathematically and scientifically figured it all out, and all of this. And, and it's even made its way into our entertainment in our world. I mean, there's movies about this, and over and over again. In fact, there's a picture that's become quite famous. It's from a movie several years ago, one of these end of the world doomsday movies. And here it is. And people have used this in many different settings, even most recently with, with a hurricane saying, ooh, look what's happening in New York and it, it's not true, but, but anyway, th this picture, and what's amazing to me is that when there are these pictures of the end of the world, it seems like it always has the Statue of Liberty. I don't know if you noticed that, and, and I'm going to take you way back old school. In the original Planet of the Apes, like in the 70s, anyone with me? Okay, they were going along the beach, and there they come up on the Statue of Liberty, and she's buried up to her waist in sand. You remember, it's like it's always the Statue of Liberty, and, and, and maybe that's because it's just such a known landmark or, or whatever it might be, it, but it, it's always poor Statue of Liberty. We thought it was about liberty, but apparently she's about the, the end of our world as we know it, and, and so I don't fear the, the end of the world, and, and all the speculations and all the, the people that, that make their, their judgments on when it happens, and especially when someone says, it has, I figured it out, and it is on this day. When someone is that emphatic, I know for a fact it's not going to end on that day. There's this little phrase that says, no one knows the day or the hour, and I just hold on to that. And here's a little piece of advice for you. If you live every day as if it were your last, eventually you'll be right. But until then, we just don't know. I don't live with that fear. There is a prospect that brings about great terror to me. That, that causes me to shudder with fear. It haunts me, and it's an image that I saw that I can't imagine it being photoshopped. It's this image. This <laughs> frightens me. The thought of all of hell's fury unleashed on the world in the form of a feline. <laughs> this could be bad. I begin to think about this, and I realize maybe this isn't so far-fetched. When meteorologists talk about hurricanes, they talk about them as a category four, <laughs> category five. They talk about catastrophic events, cataclysmic ending to our world, all of this. That's something to be afraid of. But the good thing is it's going to start with the Statue of Liberty, and so it gives me time to prepare and get into a storm cellar or something, I don't know, to guard myself from the evil cats of this world. I've got on my bucket list, about halfway on my bucket list, not the top, 
about halfway on my bucket list, I would like to go to New York for Christmas. And maybe it's because I've just watched too many movies or there's this romantic view in my mind. But you see a picture like this and you think, oh man, that would be great to be there in New York and to ice skate outside and see the tree all lit up and, and, and Central Park and Times Square and the whole thing, that would be fantastic. How, how could you not get in the Christmas spirit or to see an image like this and think, oh yeah, you know, the angels and trumpets and trees, it'd be wonderful and it'd be so great. And there are a lot of people that do that. A lot of people that go to New York to celebrate Christmas. And someday I may do that. Well, this year, there is a group of people in New York that wanted to make sure that the people who came to New York to celebrate this season, that they would be very focused on the true meaning behind the reasoning for their celebration. And so this group rented a billboard, full-size billboard in Times Square for the entire month of December. I can't even fathom how much they had to pay for this billboard for the entire month of December. And this group put a billboard up as a reminder of the true meaning of the season. It, it, we got a little close up of this. Here's the billboard, it's by the American Atheist. It's got this message, keep the merry, dump the myth, and then there's a couple of images, one of Santa Claus and, and one of Jesus. Now, I can't speak factually for the American Atheist, I'm not a part of that group, but it would imply to me as I look at this, and I'm not sure that this is what they're saying, but it would imply to me that as they put the text below each of the picture, what they're kind of saying is that if there's any myth on this billboard, it would be Jesus. And on that one, I would disagree with them. But their, their text there, keep the merry, dump the myth, became a point of inspiration for this message tonight. And that would be the message that I would have for you, devoid of the pictures. This message, this year, at Christmas, in your life, keep the merry and dump the myth. About 10 years ago, Discovery Channel had a, a new show that they brought in called The Mythbusters, and I, I love it. I love it. And so tonight I want us to just spend a little bit of time being a mythbuster, and if you'll pardon this one, kind of a, a, a Chris myth that we're going to bust, okay? And you can play with that one with your own lisp if you want to, but it's a, a Chris myth that I want us to bust and, and, and taking this idea. Teresa McBain, who is the communications director for the American Atheist, she's a spokeswoman, when asked about this billboard, stated this. She said, the true beauty of the season, family, friends, and love, have nothing to do with the, little case G, with the gods of yesteryear. Saying, all the greatness about this time of year, all the greatness in our celebration, has nothing to do with God or spiritual things at all. That that's antiquated, it's outdated, it's unnecessary. You know, if anything, it's gonna bring the mood of the season down. And with that, I will disagree with her. I'm not gonna bash her, we can agree to disagree. But she went on in this statement and she said this, indeed, the season is far more enjoyable without the religious baggage of guilt and judgmentalism. And on that one, I couldn't agree with her more. I would say, absolutely, I'm with you, Teresa. I, I agree with you that this season, that we ought to embrace the merry aspect of this season and dump the myth. And if the myth whatever that might be, has to do with some religious baggage of guilt and judgmentalism, we ought to get rid of that as well. I'm with her on that. And isn't that kind of the whole feeling of the season anyway? That we don't want negative stuff. It's Christmas after all. You're not going to kick me out on Christmas. Officer, it's Christmas Eve. Surely you, you have some mercy. In your we want the best. We don't want anything bad. Take the religion part out of it. This is what we've always been taught, even as children. We were taught this song, he sees you when you're sleeping, which is creepy in and of itself. <laughs> he knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sakes, because if you're good, Santa will bring presents under the tree and nice things in your stocking. But if you're bad, what is Santa gonna bring? Which brings me to my next point. If Santa happens to be coming through our county with an uncovered load of coal, on his open sleigh. Now, this is not a political rally. I'm not making any statements. I'm just saying, if he has an open sleigh with coal on it and he comes through pulled by these, would that constitute it being actually a coal train? And if he's coming through with this uncovered load of coal, 
It just needs to be addressed. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> because we don't want the coal, we don't want the bad. Now, you introduce God into this, and coal is the least of your worries. Because if you've been bad, he's coming, you know, with judgment and guilt, and it's not coal, it's hellfire and brimstone he's going to bring down on you. And it's that picture of God that has caused some of you to avoid church, to avoid God, to avoid anything spiritual. And I want to say, I believe that's one of the greatest myths there are about this season, about God. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah wrote a prophecy. There, there's quite a few. But in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we read these words. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, we find out later that name Emmanuel literally translated means God with us. But you might wonder, is that a good thing? I mean, God with us, if he's angry, if he's ticked off, if he's all about hellfire and brimstone and judgment and guilt, is it a good thing to have God with us? You know, by God's grace and only by God's grace, have I been allowed to have a vocation and, and a profession as a pastor? And what's amazing to me is the response of people when they find out that I'm a pastor, whether it be in a dinner setting or in a van or on a chairlift, it doesn't matter. When they find out that I'm a pastor, usually their response is something along the line of, uh-oh, oh no, I already feel more guilty. I've got to watch what I'm doing. I've got to stop, you know, all this stuff. And it's, and I'm, it's me, I'm Bob, I'm a pastor with a ponytail. I'm a pastor with a ponytail. Now you extrapolate that out more with God who sees you when you're sleeping even, and God, it would be like, oh no, uh-oh, I already feel so guilty. Here it comes, all this judgment. And that, I believe, is one of the greatest myths that we have about God, this fear that it's just going to be so awful. If we introduce God, if we bring Jesus into our season, into our life, it's going to ruin everything. That's a myth. Dump the myth. Last summer, there was a meeting that I, I was uh, a part of in Indiana. And I was flying out of Bellingham, taking that early flight that I think it's 510 flight out of Bellingham to Seattle and then on to Indianapolis. And and uh, getting onto that 510 flight meant I need to be at the airport at four something, which meant I need to get up at three something. And, and so it was early. I didn't want to wake my wife up. So I arranged for my father-in-law to take me to the airport. And the night before I started packing about 10, 30 or 11, you know, like you do. And so then got up and, and went to the airport that morning at, with about four hours sleep. And I got my bags and quietly left the house, grabbed my, my ticket and went to the file and grabbed my passport. And I went and it just, and my father-in-law dropped me off and away he went. And so I was at the airport standing in line with TSA, trying to get checked in with all this stuff. And I finally get up to the, the guy, the TSA agent, and uh, hand him my ticket, hand him my passport, and he looks at my ticket, and he looks at my passport, and he looks at me, which is common. That's what they always do. And then he looked at my ticket, and he looked at my passport, and he looked at me. And I'm just like, you oh, know, come on, hurry up. You know, I just want to get in there. I'm tired. And, and then he said, this is the worst example of fake ID I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, What? And I looked down and I realized in my sleepiness, I had inadvertently grabbed my wife's passport. <laughs> so he's looking at my name, looking at my ugly mug, and then seeing my beautiful wife. And I looked down and said, hey, that's not me. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah like, fortunately, it wasn't an international flight and I could get on with my driver's license. But there was, this, there was this kind of this mistaken identity. And I think when we get this idea that God is all about being angry, that's why he sent his son so that he could bring on guilt and judgment, he would look down at that image and say, hey, wait a second, that's not me. That's, that's not who I am. That's a myth. That's a mistaken identity. You're seeing the wrong thing. Now back to Isaiah. In the prophecies, and, and I wish we had time to go through the prophecies, maybe next year, some beautiful prophecies. But it's not all positive. There's a section of Isaiah that is actually really quite dismal. Again, going to date myself here. I grew up and I used to watch a show called Hee Haw. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about. So in Hee Haw, there was this one song that they would sing. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Remember that? Oh, deep, dark depression, excessive misery, 
If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Any, any of you remember that song? You know, gloom, despair, and agony. I mean, hee haw was supposed to be funny. That's the name, hee haw. But you hear that song, it's like you need counseling and Prozac. This is awful. The world is so dark and dismal. Well, Isaiah comes along and he has an hee haw chapter. He has this gloom and despair chapter, this hopeless chapter. Isaiah chapter 8 paints a picture of a very dark and dismal world, very gloomy, very, very hopeless. But then he starts chapter 9 with this word. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. That maybe, maybe there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe there is a new day dawning. Maybe, maybe there is some light for our darkness. Maybe there's some hope for our distress. And he goes on, verse 2. But the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And I, I've got to believe that those who heard these words for the first time or read them for the first time may not have entirely known what he was talking about. But it sounds like there's going to be light and darkness from this one, this one who would bring hope to their dark world, that would bring light, that would bring some answers to their questions. And so they waited and they expected, and there was anticipation, and there was longing, and there was hoping, and there was praying, and there was pining for this one who would bring a new day. But as we've seen already in our service, hundreds of years went by in silence, and people grew weary, wondering if this one would ever show up. And some gave up hope, and some thought it was all a myth. But then there was a birth of a little baby 2,000 years ago. And the Christmas story is arguably the best known story of all across our planet. It's just probably the best known story. And there's a lot of elements of this story. But the element of the story that I think I love the most is when the angel appears to the shepherds and that whole interaction. I love that part of the story for a lot of reasons. Not the least of which is the fact that I was the shepherd in the children's Christmas pageant because I had a terry cloth bathrobe and I could be a good shepherd. That's all it really took and a little towel on your head. But there's something about the shepherds in this story. The fact that they're even in the story is significant. And it's almost like there's a story behind the story of what's happening there. There's this other message back behind that. Because shepherds in that day were uneducated, they were unsophisticated. They weren't highly religious. They couldn't keep the ceremonial cleansing laws because they're out in the field. They couldn't make it to the synagogue. They were lower class citizens, best case scenario, lower middle class. They were nothing extraordinary. In fact, they were very forgettable individuals, just ordinary guys out in a field. Maybe even crude or crass individuals. Picture Larry the Cable Guy. These ordinary, normal shepherds, not religious guys. The fact that they're even in the story is amazing to me because they're the most unlikely ones. And the, the fact that the angels would appear to them gives a story behind the story. And so here they are. And keep in mind, they have no idea that they're a part of the Christmas story. It wasn't like the pageants that we grew up in. They weren't like, okay, guys, we're in the Christmas story. And tonight's the night, so everybody get ready with your, you know. It wasn't, they had no idea. They're just shepherds. And then an angel shows up, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them in old school, and they were sore afraid, whatever that means. Now, you remember, these guys, these guys are out there scaring off the vicious animals to protect their sheep. They don't, they don't get scared very easily. They're staying out all night without lights. I mean, they're not easily spooked. But something happens, this angel appears, and there's light. Sheep, on the other hand, are very easily spooked. You can just imagine, the angel appears, you know, they're all over the hills. They're gone. They're just sheep are just gone. And here are these shepherds, they have no more flock, and they're scared to death. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Now, wait a second. I thought you start introducing God into this whole thing, and you're going to have guilt and judgmentalism. Good news of great joy and guilt and judgmentalism don't go together for me. So one of these ideas is a myth. I mean, good news of great joy is something that makes your life better. 
It's something you want to receive. It's something you want to hear. You think about the times throughout your life where you have received good news of great joy. You think about your knee-jerk reaction to those times of good news of great joy. When you were a child and it started snowing on a school night, (laughs) that was good news of great joy. Early in your marriage, when it started snowing and your mother-in-law couldn't come to Christmas, That was good news, a great joy. When the test was canceled and everybody got an A, when you graduated, when you landed the job, when you got the promotion, when you got the raise, that's good news of great joy. When he went to Jared, (laughs) when she said yes, good news of great joy. When the test came back positive, when the test came back negative, Good news of great joy. When the Seahawks obliterated the 49ers. <laughs> oh, sure, Emmanuel, God with us, crickets. Seahawks, the place it roughs. <laughs> it's that kind of spontaneous reaction. This is good news of great joy. You want to scream, you want to shout. This is wonderful. This isn't guilt and judgmentalism. And it gets even better. It says there's good news of great joy, and it says that will be for all the people. Now, this is a God deal. So I would, it would make sense in my mind if he goes to the temple or if he goes to the synagogue, if he deals with priests or, or with some of the rabbis or the really religious people. But he says, this is good news for all people. And he underscores that by who he's telling this message to. It's these shepherds, and they're not religious. They're not super spiritual. They're just ordinary people. And he says, this is good news even for them. All of the people, this is good news for everybody. And I know that for some of you, maybe you're here tonight not by your choosing. Maybe you're here because of guilt. Maybe you're, you know, a creaster. I come at Christmas and Easter, and I feel guilty if I don't, and so I understand that. And we're glad you're here. We really are. We really are. And we'll be here on Easter, by the way. Some of you, maybe you're here and you've kind of been bribed or it's a bargaining chip. Hey, if you go to this church with me, then we can do this, whatever. And you're, so you're upholding your end of the bargain. You'll just endure it for whatever your payoff is. Some of you may have been tricked. <laughs> and this may whole, the whole thing may have been a bait and switch. They may have said, hey, we're going to go grab something to eat at Bob's or something. And you were thinking Bob's Burger and Brew and you get me and cookies. All right. And you're like, well, wait a second. This isn't what I signed up for. And some of you probably are like, yeah, I just get this thing over with so we can get on with it. And, and, and I just want to say to you, if you're in there saying, okay, but I'm not really a, you know, like a church gal or I'm not really a, a God guy, and this is good news for everybody. Regardless of if you're a church guy or a, or a godly gal or not, regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you haven't done, this is good news, he said, for all the people, even people like shepherds, even people like you and me. Say, okay, well, then what is this good news? Verse 11, he says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to, and look at this, not to Mary, okay? She gives birth, but a Savior has been born to to you, to you. And he is Christ the Lord. A Savior, not a coach, not a personal trainer, not a motivational speaker, not someone to help you try harder and do better and achieve more but a savior, someone that will give to you what you can't give to yourself, someone that will provide for you something you can't provide, someone that without their involvement, you're not going to be saved. It's a savior born to you, and this is the good news. Let me illustrate it. Okay, it's just us at the 7 o'clock, all right? This is our last service, so we can be honest here. How many of you have ever sinned? A little show of hands. Okay, so better yet. How many of you, the person next to you, has sinned? Okay, now we got 100% participation. All right. Okay, so that, that's a lot easier to see that. We've all sinned. The Bible says we've all sinned. And what are we going to do with that whole sin deal? Because that's where the guilt comes in, right? And the judgmentalism and all this stuff. 
Now, we can spend the rest of our lives trying to do enough good things to tip the scale so that maybe someday, if there is a God and a heaven and all that, that, that I will have done enough stuff to kind of somehow get in and he loves me and it's all going to be okay. The problem with that is you're going to spend the rest of your life working and never knowing if you've done enough. Well, I think I have, and I've done a lot of good stuff, and I've changed a lot, but there was that weekend in college, and there's this, and, and all those things, and you'll never really know. And he says, I don't want you to have to worry about that. This is the good news. A Savior has been born to you so that you don't have to worry about that, so that you can be forgiven from your guilt, so that you don't have to be afraid of judgmentalism, that a Savior has given to you. See, this idea, this myth that God sent his son because he was really ticked off and he wants to, wants to punish everybody, that myth he dispels in his own word. In John chapter, seven, uh, chapter 3, verse 17, this is like the, 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 the kid brother of the famous verse. John 3, 16, everyone gets the airtime on that one. John 3, 17 says this. It's the next one. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's good news. That's good news for anyone who has ever sinned in their life because God offers his forgiveness through his son so that we don't have to try and work to earn our way into his good graces, as it were. See, this idea that introducing Jesus into the Christmas season, introducing Jesus into our lives, brings guilt and judgmentalism is a myth. The reality is, when we introduce Jesus into our lives, it's because of our guilt so that we can be done with the judgmentalism. So that there can be life for us. Years ago in Monday Night Football, Don Meredith would often end at the end of a game in Monday Night Football with a little song. He would sing, turn out the lights, the party's over. And according to this billboard in Times Square, if you bring Jesus into Christmas, you might as well turn off the lights because the party's over. But the truth is, when you bring Jesus in, he turns on the light, and the party's just starting. And not just some day in eternity, that's there too. But in living in his grace and living in a right relationship with the one who loves you most and knows you best and to experience that kind of life. The Apostle Paul states it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You want good news at Christmas? The Christmas story of Jesus is 100% good news. And if anyone tells you it's anything but that, it's a myth. And he offers this to every single one of us as a gift. And we decide, do I receive that gift or do I not? And that's your decision. And some of you have received that gift and some of you have not. And some of you had that gift and you've kind of walked away and you've kept God at arm's distance and now you're kind of afraid to go back because you're guilty and all this. It's good news. It's good news. And I want to give you an opportunity tonight to receive this gift of life with Jesus. I'm going to ask if you would just bow your head right now. And if you want to invite Jesus into your Christmas season and into your life, right now, if you would just pray, and it doesn't have to be these words, nothing magical about these words. Jesus knows your heart. But to say, Jesus, I realize and I believe that you are the Savior. But I don't want you to just be the Savior. I want you to be my Savior. So forgive me. As the song says, cast out my sin and enter in. Be born in me today. And Jesus, I believe that you are the Lord, but I'm asking that you would be my Lord, that you would guide me in my life. 
you would strengthen me. You would walk with me. And so I pray that you would help me to understand and to learn and to follow you and to love you and to live in this great gift of forgiveness, a Savior born to me. And Jesus, I pray that if anyone prayed that prayer tonight, that you would give them the assurance and the depth of their soul that their sins are forgiven, and that their eternity with you is secured, and that their life can be forever changed in the grace and the goodness of the one who loves us best. I pray that we would know the truth of this good news and this great joy. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, tonight on your way out, we'd love to give you this gift. It's a New Testament. It's got a, a letter from me and some resources to help you in your spiritual journey. We want to encourage you and, and, and help you in, in that journey in any way that we can. But I would love for you to pick one of those up uh, on your way out tonight. And tonight as we close, I just want to remind you that in this dark world, Jesus came as the light of the world. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And tonight as we end our service, in a symbolic way of the light of Jesus, we're going to light candles. As you came in on your chair, there was a pin and a candle. If you didn't notice that, that'll explain why it's been uncomfortable for the last half hour. <laughs> but as you grab the candle right now, and we're going to light this, and just, just a little common sense, as you light one another's candle, if your candle is lit, would you just keep it held straight up, and then the unlit candle comes in sideways. Otherwise, if you light that way, you're going to drip wax all over everybody. But I want you to, to light this, and we're going to sing a very familiar Christmas song. And let this be reflective of the light of Jesus, the light of the world, and his light in our life as well.